tassels work that way? Well, the word for tassel is in the Hebrew is tzitzit. And the value, uh, Greek and Hebrew, the letters have value. Just like Roman numerals, I is one, I, I is two, V is five. Uh, likewise, a lot of the ancient languages, including Greek and Hebrew, uh, their letters had values, n numerical values. And if you add up the letters of the spelling tzitzit in Hebrew, it's 600. And then there was the, the thread that, that they used, 13 threads, that they doubled up it for an extra five at, at one point. Anyway, it, uh, it's 13 threads plus the number of the value uh, is 613, okay? And that is traditionally how many laws there are in the Law of Moses. Did you get that? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah. Okay, so these, uh, and that's why you will look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that little, those little tassels, tzitzits, on the corners of your garment with a numerical value of 613, uh, the number of threads plus the value of the word itself. 613 laws in the Law of Moses. Okay, now you got that figured out? Mm -hmm. Now, the corners themselves in the Hebrew is kanaf. Is that written there too for you? Yep. yep. And kanaf is, is usually, it's, it, it's the corner of the garment, but it's also translated 76 times in the Old Testament as wings. And on the edge of each wing is a seat seat. And as a matter of fact, uh, in, in the book of Psalms 91, um, the, the borders became known as the wings. So when you were under your tallet, your, the, the tallet, oh, did I tell you what a tallet is? No. That's the cloak itself. Anyway, <laughs> this is really getting complex. I know it, but I'm not communicating it too well. Anyway, the corners are called tallets. And uh, and the corners are kanaf. The, the garment is the tallet. The corners are kanaf. <laughs> kanaf already. And the garment <laughs> is just known as your wings. Seventy-six times in the Old Testament, it's translated wings. So when uh, you're in the secret place of the Most High or under the wings of the Most High, Psalm ninety-one, etc. You're protected by the Lord. Anyway, so she reached out to touch the tzitzit on the corn on the kanaf of his talit, <laughs> and she found out that the Son of Righteous shall indeed have healing in his wings. And so Messiah was believed, and this is what it boils down to. That's all the details, but. But bottom line is, the tassels on the corners of the Messiah's uh, robe, or not robe, uh, mantle, were healing, had healing power. And she believed that and was instantly healed. While he was still speaking, verse 49, Someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Wow. His only daughter, 12 years old. And when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. And when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep, she is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead, but he put them all outside. Uh, in other places, it said, uh, he put, got rid of the mourners uh, in Matthew and Mark, which also share the story. And they're professional mourners. And people would literally hire mourners to, when they lost a loved one, uh, 
to help them mourn. I'm not sure the whole cultural uh, context, but they would hire professional mourners. A poor person would hire maybe two, and uh, but somebody who was the, the leader of the local synagogue, he probably had a lot of mourners out there. And Jesus comes, and they're all wailing and carrying on. He says, get out of here. That's the last thing you need for some an atmosphere of faith is a bunch of people howling. And so he put them all out and, uh, and told her, little child, arise. He put them all aside, took her by the hand and called saying, little girl, arise. And then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. You know, in a few instances, the first thing they do is give somebody to eat after a, a, something like this. And I imagine death takes a lot out of you. You're hungry when you wake up. Anyway, um, get rid of the mourners. Save yourself some money because they're not needed anyway. He said she's only sleeping, but she's not sleeping. And... Uh, she will be made well again. Mark m mentions in the Aramaic, he says, Talitha Kumi, but uh, because Mark's writing uh, primarily to a Jewish audience, but for the sake of the Gentiles who will read it, he translates, he gives them the uh, Hebrew and then the translation, which is the same, uh, little girl arise. And uh, Luke's writing to Gentiles, he just writes it out in the Greek. Jesus only took three disciples for prayer with Jairus' daughter. Um, we don't know why. It could, I, you know, you just assume, well, these guys are the closest to the Lord. They're the ones that he sees in them, that they have the most going for them. They have the most faith. They're, they're, they're with him closer than the rest of them. Uh, he doesn't want any doubting. He wants the guys who are closest that he can trust with him. And it, it helps even the Lord to have two or three witness uh, agreeing together with him. And so he brings the three that are the, uh, the most trusted, the most faithful. Um, somebody else said, well, maybe he was just being polite not to bring 12 new people into yeah. the house. Yeah. Well, there was already a bunch of mourners in the house. But in any case, uh, the mourners didn't have faith. They, they left Jesus to scorn. He, so he threw them out. But he brought in people that believed. Jesus, the three, and Jairus and his wife, they had faith. The interesting thing is about both of these stories is that if you touch a person with an issue of blood, you're unclean. And the, the law goes out in Deuteronomy 19, I believe, to just explaining how that you have to get the, all the rituals and things that you have to go through to become clean again after touching someone with an issue of blood. If you touch a corpse, uh, you, and it, you'll be unclean for a day. And if you don't get unclean, if you don't go through the ritual, you'll be cut off from the people. I thought I wrote that scripture down, but I didn't. Um, anyway, and, uh, and the, for touching a corpse, it would be unclean for seven days. And if you didn't deal with it uh, according to the law for the purification uh, rituals, you would be cut off from the people of Israel. Well, Jesus just touched both of them, but guess what? They weren't unclean anymore. But she touched him. He didn't touch her. Still. She shouldn't have been doing that. Yeah. But the point of it is, she touched him and wasn't unclean anymore. Yeah. He touched the corpse, and the corpse wasn't a corpse anymore. Yeah. So instead of becoming defiled by the unclean, Jesus cleansed the unclean. Amen. And I think that's why that it happened together in, in historical fact, but also... Uh, it's recorded together and it's like Jesus is not worried about unclean laws he makes people clean mm -hmm. and that's what it all is about anyway his blood making mm -hmm. us clean from sin and all 
of the curses of the law. Okay, and the next thing he sends out the twelve. Earlier uh, in Luke, he mentioned the, the calling of the twelve apostles and their names. In uh, Matthew chapter 10, uh, he calls them and sends them. In Luke chapter 9, um, he's already, we already know their names. And when we looked at that a few chapters ago, there was a couple of differences, but it was just uh, uh, two names for the same guy. As happened a lot with the Israelis, they'd have a name by birth and then they'd have a name that was one of their characteristics. You know, Thomas was his given name, but Didymus is what they called him because he was a twin and that kind of thing. And so they'd have a, a kind of char uh, characteristic names uh, as well as their given name. And sometimes, like a lot of people, they don't, they're not called by their given name, they're called by nicknames and stuff. And so that's why sometimes in the list of the 12, there's different names. Anyway, um, here he's already, in, earlier in chapter 6, I believe, he, he set aside the 12. Now he feels that they're ready to go out and minister uh, without his direct supervision. So he calls his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons. I want you to notice that when you're casting out demons. We were consulted yesterday on a very, very violent uh, demon that was not coming out and uh, was just not you know, and we've, we've run across that situation a few times when people are trying to cast out a demon and it's manifesting like crazy, and yet it, it's not responding. And uh, anyway, sometimes the temptation is to feel, well, man, this one's too big. We, we can ca cast out, you know, littler demons, but this is, this is a big one. Uh, and I don't know about Becky if she's ever felt that way, but I thought, man, alive, this maybe we just don't have enough faith for this one. It's occurred to me, we we get over that hurdle and get the person delivered. Um, I don't know that we've ever prayed with someone who was serious and didn't see them delivered. I remember one instance. It was a daughter of a, a brother that was very very. Uh, we loved him very dearly. He's since gone to be with Jesus. And his daughter was just totally berserkers. And uh, he had her in the back of the truck and we went, crawled back there and we were praying for her. And, and just, she just got worse and worse. I mean, totally demonic. And it was just, and uh, we finally, well, we're just gonna have to wait till it settles down here and, and we're gonna have to talk to her and see what's going on. She never did settle down for us. But later that night, she settled down and then, it, and, and he says, what is the deal? Why is this demon all of a sudden here? Well, she's been toying with the occult. And so that demon, they just, they're just waiting for Christian children to toy with demonic stuff because they're just, Victim, the choicest victim for a demon, and um, I suspect that that's um, in question about the one that happened yesterday too. This uh, person has some issues that need to be dealt with. But anyway, um, he gave them power over all demons, and in the next chapter, he gave the twelve power over all the demons. And in the next chapter, ten, we're going to look at that next week. He gave. The 70 power over all the power of, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy, Luke 10, 19. And don't ever let the devil buffalo you. You have power over all the power of the enemy. Amen. You have authority. Mm -hmm. They may have some degree of power in this instance, but you have authority, Kathy. So what about the scripture where it says that, um, they went out and they couldn't cast someone out. They went back and talked to Jesus, and Jesus said to them, "This one only comes out by prayer and fasting." Yep, that can be. So then, would you would you specifically? Well, then sometimes, yeah. Then fast? we, if you run into a situation like that, 
then you do some prayer and fasting. But a lot of times what we've found out is that, uh, in fact, most of the time, if we have a demon that's not coming out, it's because the person is holding out. They got something going on in their life. And uh, so, but we have authority over all the power of the enemy. Uh, I like Luke sends out the 12 in chapter 9 and then has Jesus sending out the uh, 70 in chapter 10. And of course, like I said, that's historically accurate, but it, I, the, the numbers are symbolic. 12 is the number of governmental perfection, 12 tribes, and, and you know, it is the perfection of, uh, in the legal sense, kind of, the 12 apostles. And of course, there's other apostles too, but the original 12. And uh, 70 is a number of completeness. Seven is the complete number, and 70 is 10 times seven. It's, it's you know, the, the whole bag. And to me, that says that uh, the 12 represent the leaders in the, in the body of Christ. They have power to cast out demons, preach the gospel, and heal the sick. But then he sends out the 70. The whole church, anybody filled with the Spirit, has power to cast out demons, preach the gospel, and heal the sick. Amen. And uh, I believe that's the correct interpretation, too. I've been preaching it for years. It better be. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. Amen. Praise God. Demons can be very intimidating if you haven't dealt much with them. And uh, when we first began in ministry, uh, nobody was casting out demons. It, it was like, you know, in, in fact, the Exorcist movie hadn't even come out yet. But it came out, it came up out about the time, yeah, about a year after we got saved. Nobody and boy, it was just like, oh no, even the Catholic priests can cast them out. They're, they're bad. They're bad. No, any believer in Christ can, a spirit filled believer. I wouldn't try attacking this thing if I wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't believe in demons if I wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'd say he's mentally disturbed. But um, anyway, and, and so we were some of the few people that were ministering to people who were uh, demonized. And so we had a, a lot of people coming to see us because nobody else was doing it. And we kind of got into it by accident. Somebody came to church and and uh, several girls, and and they, uh, there was about four of them, and they all stayed with us for years and years. But one of them was full of demons. And that first night, uh, Tom Sullivan, who was my assistant at the time, he was, and we didn't even have a church yet. We had a coffee house. Do you want to hear this story? Yeah. Sure. Becky said no. <laughs> She said, teach the book of Luke, Kim. Come on, don't tell stories. Have you heard this story before? Okay, Clyde has. Yeah. Anyway, long story short. Sure. <laughs> it left. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> no, Tom was just praying, kind of, so, you know, she said, well, I got these problems. He said, well, we just command you devil to take your hand off of her and, he didn't, you know, he was just rebuking the devil like people do when they're praying sometimes, not, he, not expecting he's really talking to one, you know, the imaginary devil, you know, that devil that's picking on all of us all the time. And, and all of a sudden, no! And it's, the woman spoke with a, a heftier voice and fell on the ground, rolled her eyes back and said, she's mine! And Tom goes, uh-oh, and he picked up the phone and Becky and I had gone home about a half hour earlier and he says, you better get back here. We got a demon. A what? A demon. I mean, it's, it's laying on the floor saying that she's mine. And so, whoa, you sure she isn't faking it? <laughs> anyway, um, she was ultimately delivered that night. And uh, we learned, we bought some books and heard some teachings and got deeper into it. Most preachers at that time didn't think a Christian could have a demon. And a lot of people still think that, even in spirit-filled churches, that well, if you've got the Holy Spirit, how can you have a demon? 
How can a demon and the Holy Spirit live in the same house? Well, how can the flu and the Holy Spirit live in the same house? A demon is just another form of demonic oppression, sickness, whatever. Anyway, so we have authority and he gave, he'd sent them off to do exactly what he was doing. Uh, to preach the kingdom, of, he gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece, just with the clothes on your back. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake the very dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And so they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. He wanted to prove to them, this isn't a commandment that is made for the all time don't bring any supplies and things like that because later on Jesus himself said uh, are we well supplied and Peter says we even have a sword okay it's good and so he did allow them to do this but he wanted them to learn the lesson that God will take care of you we never charge for our services oh well that healing will cost you a hundred dollars uh, and that demon says, it's a big one, that's going to be 250 you know. No, we don't charge, but we do take offerings. And we do believe that people will be thankful and give, and that we will be supported. And uh, that's one of the challenges in going full-time in the ministry, is you're saying, okay, God, I'm going to trust you to supply our needs. When we first did that in 1976, we didn't, we didn't want to even mention money. We put a little bowl in the back table, and I know I've shared this story. And uh, we'd mentioned somewhere in the night that, by the way, if you want to help us with this ministry, uh, just you know, put a little something in the uh, bowl back there. And um, almost nothing came, you know, maybe $5 a weekend. And uh, just, well, what's wrong here? And uh, well, obviously, we weren't doing it right, we didn't have the faith, or something wasn't working. I went back to work. And uh, I went full time for the Lord. Why am I gonna trust God? Well, it didn't work for about nine months. And so finally I said, okay, and I went back to work. But then uh, a few months, just two or three months after that, people did start giving. And I left my job. And this was a good job. He wanted to make me night foreman and everything. And um, uh, well, I would. I wanted to talk to you too. I'm going to leave. <laughs> and that was a tough conversation. I'd like to see you in the office, Kim, because uh, we're putting on a night shift. And anyway, he's going to make me the lead man of the night shift. And, and I said, well, I wanted to. Anyway, I left. And but God has kept us full time in the ministry ever since 1977. So um, that's what he, he's telling them. Trust the Lord on this thing. Don't be a busybody. If you go from house to house, staying a couple of nights with one person and a couple of nights with other, it just created the uh, impression of a busybody. And plus, people talk to you. Uh, when we came home from India, and we didn't know it would be our last uh, furlough home, but people always invited us over to eat. And they'd, they'd feed us and everything. We'd say, boy, I love lasagna's the in dish this year. I don't think I can eat any more lasagna anyway. <laughs> but we'd get invited to different places, and then people would talk to us. And then later on, it came back to you. The leader, like back on us, the leaders of the church were saying, you're trying to sow discord. Every time you went to somebody's house, they were talking against the church, and you were encouraging them and trying to sow discord. I said, we were just, they invited us to eat, and they talked, and we tried to 
answer t hard questions without making any trouble, but they, they, a lot of them were disgruntled people. And uh, anyway, it was just really blew up in our face. Now we didn't, it, we weren't staying with them. We were just, but we were in, in responding to invitations to dinner. And, and that's, that gave me kind of insight into this, don't go from house to house because it, it, it could backfire you, on you. Okay, and um, if they don't receive you, if nobody will put you up, shake the dust off your feet as a curse against them, basically, and move on to the next town. Preach the kingdom of God, heal the sick, cast out demons, the threefold Jesus, ministry of Jesus. And uh, like I said, you don't charge for it, but the people will support you. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard of all, this verse, uh, how did I get there? Luke 9, 1, oh, that's 6, okay, so verse 7, Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had arisen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, John I have beheaded, but who is this who, of whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Um, just a week or two ago, I shared the story of John the Baptist and how Herod did have him beheaded. It was a, a nasty deal. And so now he's feeling guilty because Jesus is on the scene. And he said, what, John's returned from the dead? What's going on here? And he wants to figure it out. Jesus never did go see Herod until he stood before him before his crucifixion. And uh, he, he was not about to go on the beck and call of dictators when they wanted to check out the latest guy on the scene. Then the next event is uh, feeding the 5,000. recorded one of the few stories or few accounts that's recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John a lot of times doesn't record the same, you know, give his account of the same stories because by the time John wrote the Gospel of John it was the 80s or 90s AD and the rest of the Gospels have been out there for 30 or 40 years already. And so he knew, everybody knew the, the basic uh, events of Christ's life. And so he usually uh, looked at uh, a few choice stories and, and le with lessons to be learned. But in this case, the feeding of the 5,000, all four of the evangelists uh, share his story of the 5,000. Here's Luke's version. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him of all they had done. And he took them aside and went privately into a des deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. I have a map. Uh, Bethsaida is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. You have to have some multimedia presentation a little bit each time. map for projection. It's all the funny colors. And it doesn't really help us much. But anyway, um, can you see the little lake up in the, near the top? That's the Sea of Galilee. And at the very northeast corner is a little dot that says Bethsaida. This is the hometown of uh, Peter and Andrew. But beyond that is wilderness. And the wilderness there, we think of wilderness as grizzly bears and, and forests and deep snow. Uh, the wilderness in Israel is desert type area, not sandy desert, but arid country. And so it's, uh, there's not a whole lot going on there. Although uh, in one of the accounts, 
It says, and they, they all sat on the green grass. And uh, it, and another one, it says that it was the Passover season. And uh, and John says that when they when they multiplied the loaves, they were barley loaves. And the barley hot harvest is in March. So that all points to a springtime in Israel. Green grass, barley loaves, and the Passover, of course, which is in the spring. The apostles, when they returned, told him all they had done. He took them privately to a place belonging, deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. He wanted to get alone with the boys, but they found out about it. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, the twelve came to him and said, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. Um, that was not practical at all. The villages around that area might have 300, the bigger cities might have 3,000, but there's none of them around. So whatever is there, it's not going to be able to put up hundreds and hundreds of people. We find out it's actually 5,000 plus women and children. And so there's a lot of people there and there's no way they would have found any place to stay or eat. So Jesus said, you give them something to eat. Yeah, you know, I kind of wonder what the apostles are thinking. Okay, there's no food here. There's no place to put them up. Uh, maybe some of them would get lucky if they go out there and look around, you know. But Jesus just uh, faced it and said, no, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. And then he took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they all ate and were filled and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. I just wonder how they did that. I, I have a picture that I use a lot, and it might be on the cover of this, no, but it's a picture of Jesus with uh, James and John and Peter behind him. And Peter's got a fish in his hand and a bag on his uh, back with loaves in it. and. Uh, and the other, John and James, are, are obviously them because they look a lot alike, like brothers. And I'm, but I looked at them pictures and I saw, but they didn't have a big bag full of loaves. They just had five loaves. <laughs> and they didn't have loaves either. That's, it was five pieces of bread. Have you ever seen the kind of bread they eat in Greece and the Mediterranean? And, it's flatbread. Right. It doesn't come in loaves. You know, get, go order a gyros. It comes in a, in a flatbread. And unleavened bread, they just made it like Indians make chapatis. For, we Indians were kind of funny. They'd find white American or British bread to have Lord's Supper with. And every day they eat unleavened bread with their meals. Come on, you guys, just eat some chapatis, man. You, you Don't get leavened bread because it says Britannica on it. <laughs> anyway, it, it's funny, but bottom, bottom line is uh, they didn't have loaves and they didn't have big bags full of it. They just handed out these chapatis and they kept having some more in their hand. They keep handing them out and they'd still have more. How did that happen? We only have five to begin with. Now 12 of us are handing out handfuls. To and the a, fish. To 100 groups of 50. To 100 groups of 50. Wow. 
And after everybody was stuffed, they picked up five or 12 basketfuls, one for each of the apostles to carry home. Mm -hmm. They were concerned, but they, the apostles, but they had no real means to dealing with it. Jesus took what was given and multiplied. He does that a lot. What, what little we give him, he multiplies it back. Yeah. All the time in, mm -hmm. in our day-to-day -day life in every area. You do something nice for somebody with the right heart and a bunch of people will start being nice to you. Sometimes they'll be just the opposite, you know, because there is such a thing as a devil. I've tried to walk on water, but I didn't need to. You know, I, I literally, every time I go to a swimming pool, I, I can't resist. I want to walk on water so bad. You can ask Becky every time. I try to walk on water. I don't know if I've tried it in the last 10 years, maybe. I don't know if I've gone swimming much. Anyway, but God only brings a miracle when there's a need. And there was a need for a big one here. He's not intimidated by the size of the problem. 12 baskets left over. A good host always provides more than enough for his company. In Israel, that was a rule. You didn't just have enough. You had to have a lot left over so they knew you were a good host and were prepared to feed them to the max. Mm -hmm. And Jesus proved to be a very good host, took almost nothing, multiplied it to feed 5,000 plus. Now we say that they only counted the men, and it says that in, in uh, here it says there were 5,000 but uh, people, but uh, in John it says in the, men, the number of the men was about 5,000. And uh, there might not have been that many women and children following Jesus out into the wilderness to begin with. They might have stayed home. But uh, at the same time, it was more than 5,000 people and 12 baskets left over. Wow. Verse 18, any questions so far? We're just kind of looking at stories that we've all heard, but hopefully we're learning some good stuff still. If you can remember the difference between a tallit and a tzitzit and a, okay. Luke chapter nine, verse 18, and it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them, saying, who do the crowd say that I am? And of course, this is brought on by Herod's words. Who do they say that I am? And they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. Others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Of course, we remember the the, John, the Matthew version a little bit more where he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're not just, he's not just another prophet. He's not a resurrection of Elijah or John the Baptist. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah that has been prophesied ever since Adam and Eve first sinned. The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the viper. And all of the prophecies throughout the hundreds of years of the Old Testament period coming to a, con a fruition, a con the fulfillment in the life of Jesus Christ. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribed and be killed and be raised the third day. 
He always told them not to tell anybody. You've noticed that. When he healed somebody, he says, don't tell anybody. And of course, they went out and told everybody. And now the disciples say, we know who you are. And don't tell anybody. Because he would have become arrested a lot sooner. He was worried that they were just going to uh, take him and arrest him. And he would not be able to fill his ministry if the word got out the way they wanted it to. So I kept saying, don't, don't you know. Let me operate in God's timing without a bunch of uh, fanfare that brings more attention upon us than we can handle. He warns them several times, and they just like to ignore this part mm -hmm. about, well, I'm going to die. One time Peter says, far be it from you. And, and what did he say to Peter then? Get thee behind me. Get behind me, Satan. You're, you're talking devil talk there, Peter. Don't do that. But, um, you know, the rest of this, I uh, take up your cross. And I want to talk about that at some length because that's so powerful.